Hi everyone, in today's video lecture we're going to do two things. First, we'll define a few key terms, and second, we'll trace the institutional history of popular culture in the United States. Popular culture can be a hard thing to pin down, and to define exactly. It's a lot like what Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart said in 1964 when determining the threshold for what constitutes obscenities, or more to the point, hardcore pornography. Justice Stewart articulated his definition of pornography this way, I know it when I see it. It's often really hard to establish and apply a set of rigid, defining characteristics that make something popular culture. We have to just know it when we see it. We feel it. It feels like popular culture. Okay, so before we move on, I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to give your mind a little bit of time to suppress that incredible and definitely not photoshopped image of Justice Stewart that you just witnessed. And secondly, and more importantly, I need to do the YouTube thing. So please subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave a comment. It really helps me and the channel out tremendously. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't intend to belabor the point of sorting various bits and pieces of culture and history into bins, some labeled pop culture and others elite or folk culture or mass culture or what have you. While typology and organization are important, I just don't find that work particularly interesting or very fruitful when it's sustained. Unless it's to determine whether or not this Photoshop of Kawhi Frost Troll on the path to High Hrothgar from Skyrim qualifies as pop or folk culture, or obviously high culture and fine or high art, since it's clearly art of the finest caliber and of the greatest merits. Anyhow, I'm getting a bit off topic, I suppose. Okay, where where were we? Oh, ah, yes, yes. To be clear, defining our terms, at least preliminarily, is a good starting point, so we'll do just that. Okay, so here's the plan. Let's try to define culture. Then after that, pop culture. And finally, we'll turn our attention very briefly to the history of pop culture studies as a discrete field of study in academic discipline. All right, so what do we mean when we talk about culture? The word culture is tricky. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Etymologically, the term comes from French by way of Latin, meaning to cultivate or rear crops. In other words, to grow or to bring into being, to raise, to nurture. And this feels rather apt if you think about it. We're born into this world, thrown into being, if you want to get kind of philosophical about it, and like a new player in a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, you essentially are blank. You're a tabula rasa. You have to learn or be taught everything. You're like tofu. You're sort of flavorless when you enter into the world, and you can absorb everything around you. Let's try to keep this originating agrarian sort of meaning in mind as we move forward. We're going to circle back to it throughout the semester. Now for me, my go-to starting point for defining the culture concept lies with the earliest anthropological definition of the term provided by Sir Edward Burnett Tyler, aka E.B. Taylor, aka the original pancake. In his 1871 book entitled Primitive Culture, which is a classic and important work, but as the title suggests, was and is very backwards and ethnocentric in its adherence to social Darwinist theories. Tyler defines culture as that complex whole which includes knowledge, beliefs, art, morals, laws, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a member of society. Being the magnificently bearded man that he was, E.B. Tyler, particularly in his youth, could very easily be confused for a modern-day bespeckled hipster with their proclivities for well-kept facial hair, IPAs, and an extensive vinyl collection of musical artists that you've probably never heard of. What I'm trying to say is this. Edward, a.k.a. E.B. Tyler, a.k.a. the original Pancake's laundry list style definition is our starting point for figuring out the boundaries, if you want to call it that, of culture. As it turns out, culture includes a lot of things that human beings do and think and feel. It's really hard to decide what is and isn't culture. Anyway, let's jump forward in time a bit to the mid-20th century. And this brings us to Raymond Williams. One of the leading figures of cultural studies, Williams once wrote that culture was, quote, one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. Now, I neither have the time nor the wherewithal to unpack Williams's many contributions to the study of culture and everyday life, or to even scratch the surface of his understanding of culture in this video. For those interested in that, I'd point you to two of his books, Culture and Society and Keywords, a vocabulary of culture and society. But what I can offer is this. In his entry for culture, in that second book I just mentioned, Keywords, and here I'm citing the 1983 expanded and revised edition that most folks tend to cite, Williams offers up three broad definitions of culture. According to Williams, culture is a general process of intellectual, spiritual, and aesthetic development. It's a particular way of life, whether of a people, a period, or a group. And it consists of the works and practices of intellectual and especially artistic activity, or in other words, signifying practices. For folks like Matthew Arnold, an English cultural critic working in the 19th century, or F.R. Levis, a 20th century literary critic who was influenced by Arnold's thinking, 
Culture wasn't a whole way of life or learned shared collective values or beliefs or those broad categories of existence enumerated by E.B. Tyler's laundry list definition of culture. For Arnold and later Levis, culture was the finer things, the very best that a society could muster. For them, culture, with a capital C, so to speak, stood in sharp contrast with emerging cultural forms that they perceived to lack order or standards. Mass or popular culture was subversive, sunken, low. They believed that it had the potential to lead to decline and anarchy. To put it another way, they viewed mass culture a bit like I imagine a nutritionist would view fast food or junk food. They believed it lacked substance, it didn't nurture, it was addictive, in short, it was harmful to those who consumed it. It was exactly these kinds of exclusionary conceptualizations of culture that Raymond Williams sought to write against, which I think is nowhere more clearly stated than in his 1958 essay entitled Culture as Ordinary, in which he argues just that. Okay, so let's try to distill all of this down into its essence, shall we? Culture is a learned, shared behavior. Culture is constituted or cultivated or nurtured through individual action, but it is also inherently and necessarily social, right? If everyone died, culture wouldn't exist. Think about whatever language you speak. For me, that's English. If every single person who spoke or read or understood English died in some sort of weird global accident, well, English really wouldn't exist anymore. Culture requires continuous practice and renewal through individual acts or instantiations or performance. People do culture, in other words. Culture is also meaningful and a part of the meaning-making or semiotic process. I always personally like to envision the word lifestyle, and then I invert it a bit and think about culture as the stylization of life, or to imagine that culture is like an operating system of sorts that human beings simultaneously run on but also program. And then we can't forget the originating meaning where culture is something that one isn't born with. It's cultivated or grown, absorbed, and continuously produced and reproduced, and as a result it changes in both small, unnoticeable ways and by magnificent leaps and bounds. And honestly, I don't think we've much defined or distilled the term culture as much as we've clarified the fact that it's complicated and kind of fuzzy, for lack of a better word. And now that we've kind of confused ourselves even more about what culture is, this begs the question, what is popular culture? Popular culture is often defined in contrast or opposition to something that it isn't. In cultural theory and popular culture, John's story outlines six general ways in which popular culture has been approached or defined. First, popular culture is something that is widely favored or liked. It has mass appeal, in other words. Second, it could be viewed as a kind of refuse or a dumbing down or a devolution or a reduction of high culture. Think fine art becoming memes. Third, it's something that exists in mass. It's mass produced, commercial, and therefore standardized and formulaic. Fourth, popular culture could be viewed as cultural forms that emerge from the people, the masses. It represents the vox populi, the voice of the people. Fifth, Popular culture is a site of ideological struggle between dominant and subordinate peoples and forces. And finally, adopting a more postmodern perspective, let's say, maybe there is no such thing as low and high culture anyway. These are just arbitrary social categories that we've absorbed and created, reified and reproduced, oftentimes with little or absolutely no thought of how or why we even do this. We'll talk about all of these various perspectives throughout the semester, particularly number five, but I want to consider just one more point of view here before we turn our attention, very briefly, to the history of the institutionalization of popular culture studies in the United States. Meet folklorist Henry Glassie. He defines popular culture in opposition to what folklorists call folk culture. Now, that's another complicated term to define with equally, if not more, fuzzy boundaries to contend with. But Glassie proposes an interesting formula for understanding some of the characteristics of folk culture and popular culture as they relate to time and space. He argues this, that popular culture varies maximally through time, but minimally through space, while folk culture varies maximally through space, or region if you want to think of it that way, but minimally through time. Let me make that more concrete, with the help of some stupid graphics. Okay, so let's take Darth Vader as an example of popular culture. For all intents and purposes, Darth Vader, as a cultural form that is massively distributed throughout various societies and ways of being, the image of Anakin Skywalker, aka Darth Vader, aka Crispy Pancake, will remain essentially the same, no matter if you're talking to someone about their love of the dark side, the Sith, and the Star Wars franchise. 
And again, it doesn't really matter if they live in Kentucky or New Orleans, Canada or Los Angeles. Darth Vader is more or less the same in each of these various spaces, though there is an argument that could be made against this thesis. Let's save that for another time. Now, with regards to time or temporality, that is where things start to change quite a bit. So although one's image of Darth Vader or the Sith, let's say, might not change whether you're in Cleveland or Prague, popular culture is constantly and rapidly changing over time. Consumers are constantly being offered new products, new intellectual properties, new films, books, movies, and action figures, and thus we get different versions of Darth Vader in animation, video games, comics, and toys. And we get new characters like Darth Maul, Darth Malgus, and most importantly, characters like Ben Swallow. Perfection. Okay, so that's enough of this whole definition business. We've kind of sort of got a better, I guess, handle of culture and popular culture. So let's move on. All right, now for some history. We'll be talking about various intellectual traditions, including Marxism, the Frankfurt School, semiotics, the Birmingham School, participatory culture, and so on in this video series. But here, I just want to briefly outline the institutional history of pop culture studies, particularly in the context of the United States. The study of pop culture owes a lot to scholar, author, and educator Ray Brown. Let me tell you a bit about him. Brown was born in Alabama in 1922. He and his family lived in poverty in the wake of the Great Depression. He served in the European theater of World War II and was educated at the University of Alabama, the University of Birmingham, and the University of Nottingham, before later returning to the U.S. to earn his master's degree at Columbia University and his Ph.D. in English and folklore from UCLA in 1956, where he studied under the supervision of folklorist Louise Pound. In 1967, Brown joined Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, with the intention of developing the academic study of popular culture. In that same year, Brown founded the Journal of Popular Culture, serving as its first editor. Over a half century later, the Journal of Popular Culture is still going strong as the premier journal dedicated to the study of popular culture. Two years after joining BGSU, Brown established the Center for Popular Culture Studies, which today houses the Ray and Pat Brown Popular Culture Library. Alongside Russell Nye, Brown established the Pop Culture Association as an alternative to both the American Studies Association and the American Folklore Society. In 1973, Brown, Michael Marsden, and Jack Nackbar founded the Department of Popular Culture Studies Master's Program. The following year, the program began offering a bachelor's degree in popular culture. At first, popular culture, what was often referred to as mass or low culture, was ignored or outright frowned upon by the academy. It wasn't viewed as something that was worth examination. Think back to Levis or Arnold. Then folks like Williams and others, particularly those working in the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, and people like Brown started to study mass culture, folk culture, and everyday life. And over time, attitudes, at least in part, changed, and a wide variety of scholars and educators across a range of disciplines began to study, write about, and teach courses focusing on popular culture. Okay, so just to wrap up here, if you're interested in getting a degree or an advanced degree in popular culture studies, here are some programs where you can do just that. Pause the video if you want more time to read the list. Likewise, here's a partial list of archives with large pop culture holdings. Again, if you need more time, pause. Okay, one last time, if you enjoy this content or want to support the channel, please subscribe, like the video, and leave a comment. I would really, really appreciate it. Okay, that's it for today. Take care of yourself and others, and thanks for watching. Bye.